Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys. I, right now, everybody's still flooding in a little bit, but uh, we're going to get started. Good morning, everybody online. I'll, uh, I'll see you when I walk over to the computer in a second, but it's great to be together. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's a great day to worship God. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to we're gonna sing some songs and, and spend some time worshiping God. God, you are incredible, and uh, we are we are so fortunate to be able to know you, and uh, so I am very distracted, God, by my own voice in the reverb there, but uh, God, we just want to sp spend this time letting you know just that we, that we love you, and uh, we are so grateful for how much more you love us. God, you are incredible, and uh, we just, uh, we, we are grateful for the family you've also given us here. And I pray that this will be a fragrant offering to you. Amen. Amen. Stand up. <laughs> Keep the energy up, amen? We're going to sing every praise. All right, here we go. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Oh, 
guess it's my turn. <laughs> All right, yeah, you can go have a seat. Hi, everyone. I am Jeff Ryan, and I um, have a son in the teen ministry, a junior, and I have a son in college, and I'm married to my incredible, awesome wife, Shelly, and we work with the teens. So it's been awesome. A little plug next week, they um, are going to do something very special for you mothers. So please attend. Um, I want to read something to you. It's in Luke 21. It's about the poor widow. It says, as Jesus looked up, okay, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, and he saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. And when I read this, you know, I realize, you know, God is measuring my offering. <laughs> Literally, he's standing there, or he's actually looking up, and he's actually in the temple, and he's measuring the offering. But it's not, it's not based on monetary value. It's a... Uh, like the larger the amount, the more value it brings to God. No, it's based on the cost to the person giving it. So the bigger the sacrifice um, to one's life, the more valuable that offering is. You know, if you think about it, this is a revolutionary thinking uh, because what he's saying is, come to me all you poor and give me your pennies. And then, um, you know, yeah, you rich, you can keep yours, you know, or, you know, hold on to it. And if you think about it, the, <laughs> the teachers of the law and the um, Pharisees probably didn't like that much because it's, it's basically saying, we, you're going to give me your pennies. I want you to give me your pennies for the church offering and not necessarily the wealth. And so you can imagine he riled up some people through that. Um, it's kind of the equivalent of probably you know, Vince or maybe Brian Gross saying, hey, <coughs> um, teens, bring me your, um, your few bucks every week for mowing lawns or babysitting. Uh, but those who give a hundred, you know, a couple hundred dollars a week, you know what? Um, it's not as valuable. Think about that. What would that do to our operating budget? <laughs> but you know what? I have to look at the scripture before to kind of give some context about this. If you look at the scripture right before that, at the end of Luke, it says basically, and he's talking to the teachers of the law. He says they devour widows' houses. And for show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And you think about it. He's saying, okay, these uh, the teachers of the law, they actually couldn't receive money um, from the treasury, actually, that was against the Moses law. And so they actually had to go out and solicit it. And these teachers of the law were actually equivalent to what we would call today lawyers because they were experts in the law. Like today we have experts in our law. And so with that, they had to actually go out and solicit that money, and they preyed upon the weakness and the vulnerable and the oppressed in society, which a lot of these widows had those means, you know, having estates and having homes and things like that. And so some of them didn't know how to do finances, and so these lawyers would actually go in there and bas basically milk them dry for all they had. So at that point, this is when Jesus looks up, doesn't he? His timing is impeccable. He says, and he points it out. Look at that widow giving him over there, her offering, because he just rebuked the, the teacher's law by pointing out the widow. He may be pointing out really the devastating effect of what the milking and the, of the, um, what happened to the widows to this woman. In fact, he may have known in his sovereignty that this woman was actually a victim of one of those lawyers or one of those teachers of law and was pointing it out. And some of the experts, or um, um, scholars actually believe that this was the beginning, this was the end of Jesus' public ministry, because the very next verse after he, he says this about the widow um, giving is when he announces the destruction of the temple. So there's this transition here going on. And so if you think about it, it's a huge turn, because what he's announcing is this is, this is the end. This is the, the end. We've the teachers who are supposed to be upholding the law have now perverted it to the point where it's stealing from the most vulnerable in our society using the law. And think about that. Think about how, what the, the effect that that would have on society. And so now he, then he announces it. 
we're going to have the destruction of the, the temple. But you know what? Today, Jesus uses these narratives to have us assess our own hearts, to kind of look at where we're at today. You know, we've got some characters now, now in scope here. We've got the teachers of the law. I don't think, you know, hopefully we don't have that amongst us, but it is definitely prevalent in our society today. Um, and then you got the wealthy, definitely you know, prevalent in our society. And then we have poor, and we have widows. So I think what it does for me personally is it makes me, it forces me to look at my own faith when I compare myself to all of these characters, but especially the, the widow. Um, you know, if you look at the teachers of the law, I mean, how much faith does it require from anybody to devour and to basically satisfy your own needs by stealing that? It requires zero faith. And yet these were the teachers of the law. And then you think about how much is it, how much faith does it require to actually give out of your abundance? Not much, because you know you're always going to have more. But the widow's faith was the greatest. And Jesus says, you know what? She gave all she had to live on, which means that she knew she wouldn't have anything left. And so here's the most praiseworthy thing about her. It's her faith, because he's saying, she gave to meet the needs of others while trusting that her own needs would be met. And for us here today, that's the challenge when we give. It's the faith. And so, and if you think about it, he turned to his disciples. This is the type of faith that he actually wanted to author in their hearts. This woman's faith. A humble and sincere reliance upon God for everything. And this is the heart that we all, you know, should have hopefully pursue in our week, in our giving. And I think about my giving today. You know, I really want my giving, the moment it becomes comfortable, that's the moment it no longer requires my faith. And I lose the heart of the widow. So what am I going to do? I have to have a response to that. So with you and your hearts today, think about it in the future too. Remember this woman's example of your faithful giving and her dependence and reliance upon God. Let's go to God in prayer. God, you are the most faithful God to us. Um, you give when we can't see. I mean, you've formed our lives, and you've given us um, clothing and shelter and society and, and a home and this incredible church and relationships. I mean, you completely and um, meet all of our needs. And I think about <coughs> the, the, the way that things had demoralized and deteriorized, deteriorated in that society at that time to the point where Jesus steps in and says, it's over. And he rescues us. And thank you that we have um, an example of a woman who, you know what, we can point to. Um, I, I pray that we don't forget that. I pray that we give out of sincere, faithful hearts, but also meeting the needs of the church and those around us. We love you, God. We pray that this offering pleases you today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning, guys. Good morning. We have just a few announcements this morning. Um, for those who don't know you, no, those who don't know me, my name is Kathy, and I work for the church in the capacity of one of your administrators. And uh, I read the announcements every Sunday, <laughs> most Sundays. Uh, let's talk about camp. So we're getting down to the wire. I checked it this morning. There's now 17 spots left. I think everybody over here in this section is registered. So way to go, guys. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you, you at home. <laughs> are your kids registered? Do, they have, do you have kids who are going into grade five or above this coming fall? If so, you should think about sending them to camp because it's pretty awesome, right teens? Yeah, yeah. okay, so get registered. Um, registration will close on May 23rd or when we hit our cap of 140, whichever comes first. This coming Friday, we have a congregational devotional. It will be on Zoom only. Uh, the link can be found in the app, and also uh, check your email as well. Uh, this coming Sunday, we, as Jeff mentioned, we are having a teen-led Mother's Day service. So I'm very excited to, uh, to see all these guys up on the stage. Um, weather permitting, we are going to do that outside on the front lawn out here underneath the trees. Uh, so, And uh, I believe that starts at 10 a.m. Uh, then uh, we have our men's and women's midweeks. Men's midweek is on Wednesday, May 12th. Women's midweek is Wednesday, May 26th. Uh, the, de the details and uh, links for those can be found in your app or in your email. Uh, and we have our mobile market on Friday, May 21st, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We do need volunteers, and the volunteer uh, registration for that is now open. 
Uh, go to hopewww.gatewaycitychurch.info to register if you'd like to volunteer. And if you know somebody who needs food, we do not require any kind of um, proof of need or anything like that. If they need food, come on by. We'll load up their car and give them some food. Uh, that's going to do it for this week. And uh, I believe Vince is coming up now to preach the word. Aha, good morning, church. Woo, it's good to see you all. Good to see everyone in the room. So, this mic's a, this mic's a little hot. A little hot. All right, um, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, There's a number of people in here this morning. Yeah. This is very inspiring, and uh, welcome to those of you on Zoom and on YouTube and uh Hopefully you're having a great time of worship so far. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts. Um, I don't think I need to tell you every week that our, our um, theme is good news. But we do have a, a couple of stories. I do, okay, our theme is good news. Got people in the room here, they're telling me what to do. So I got to remind you that the theme is good news. And um, we are finding great news stories in the book of Acts. And I tell you, we got a story this morning. There's a couple of stories that are very inspiring. In fact, there are probably three stories within this particular section that we're going to read this morning. So I hope you're inspired. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you get some good news out of this. I hope you find your good news story in this as well. And uh, well, without any further ado, I want to go to God in prayer. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. We really thank you for the Bible. Thank you for your word, God, that you saw fit, God, to uh, give us, uh, Father, your word, Father, which really is the power to transform, God, our lives, not only individually, but collectively, God. You transform groups of people, Father. Uh, you change, Father, things in ways, Father, that we don't even quite imagine, God. I look around the room and I, I see such a, a, a diverse collection of people, God, and this is only your power, Father, just uh, brought together so many different people, God. And Father, even those of us that we may look alike on the outside, we're so different and so diverse inwardly, God. We have different ways of thinking, different upbringing, Father, different levels of education, Father, different bank accounts, God, if you will. There's a lot of differences between us, God, and yet we have this oneness in you, Jesus, and we thank you for that. Thank you that you, uh, you cared so much, Jesus, to, to bring together people. You, you, you love so much, God, that uh, Jesus, you, you sent Jesus, who uh, loved this mission uh, that we all get to join in, loved it so much that he died for it. And I pray uh, always that our hearts are not only glad and not only uh, excited, but our hearts are responsive uh, God, to uh, that sacrifice. May we always, uh, God, look to you, Jesus. May we always remember what you've done for us. May we always lean into your scripture. May we lean into your goodness. When we lean into uh, just even the areas perhaps where we're weakest, uh, God, so that we can be made stronger. May we be humbled by our weaknesses, God, at all time, God. And so anyway, we love you so much. It's so great to be together this morning. I pray, Father, that if we need to be comforted this morning, God, you'll comfort us. And yes, God, if we need to be made uncomfortable, God, then make us uncomfortable, please. God, help transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, you know, there are things that, that I find to be somewhat disgusting. You know what I mean? You all, we all have things that disgust us, right? You know, and uh, they, we, we, we have a sort of, there, there's, a, there's a core disgust uh, within all of us. Uh, there are things socially that disgust us. There are things morally that disgust us. But believe it or not, we're all disgusted to some degree by animal-like things. We all are. And so there are things that disgust all of us. So I find mushrooms to be disgusting. I see. As soon as I say that, everyone goes, I love them. Amen. So that's how diverse we are, okay? It tells you that I don't have control over the church because I'd say, let's hate mushrooms together, y'all. No. There are many things that disgust us. 
food disgusts us. I say chitlins, you may go, oh my gosh. Who would ever eat hog intestines? Facts. <laughs> Tuna. Right, Jeff Hovey? <laughs> Body products. Feces. Vomit. Yeah, see, even as I say it, people go, yeah. You know what I mean? Animals. Rats. <laughs> Insects. Roaches. Sexual behavior. Incest. Homosexuality. Contact with dead corpses. That's disgusting to some people. You ever go to a funeral and someone leans over and kisses the dead body and you go, <laughs> you're uncomfortable, right? The teens. <laughs> Violation of exterior body. Gore or deformity. Poor hygiene. You find disgusting, right? Hanging out with unsavory people, prostitutes, drug addicts, criminals, child molesters. Disgusting. Moral offenses, racism, people who speed by you like they're in a video game. Drive by me on 64, I'm going, what is going on? Where is the fire? And there's always three of them. <laughs> so, so drug dealers, people who cheat on their spouses. There are things that discuss all of us, and I could go on and on and on. And I think what... The reason I bring that up is because I think when you when we look in the book of Acts, and Bill is going to get to talk about this a little bit more next week in chapter 10, you look at Peter's journey, he really is, you might say, on a journey of disgust. And let me tell you what I mean here. Let's go back to Acts chapter 8. And... Um, Bill did a great job with this section, but I want to just sort of remind us, highlight a little area here in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, you keep in mind that Peter was a good Jewish boy. He knew not to associate with Gentiles and not even those Samaritans that have to have Gentile. But in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, the Bible says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. I'm going to go confirm what's going on down here. I can't believe God's letting these people in. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Wow, proof that even the Samaritans can be saved. And so as Peter and John leave, verse 25, it says, After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So as they're on their way home, if God's going to let the Samaritans in, then we might as well stop at the Samaritan villages and share our faith. Amen? Amen? So they evangelize their way home, talking about the Lord Jesus to people in the villages. Later that week, in Acts chapter 9, something is prompting Peter, which we, can know, we know to be only the Spirit of God. Peter, as he sort of, he starts on another little journey from Jerusalem, which is south. And he decides he's going to go north, and he's going to go into a few towns. 
to check on the disciples that had been scattered by the persecution that broke out because of Stephen. Amen? And right as he's traveling, you got to keep in mind that old Saul here, he's up in Damascus, and he's now making his way down to Jerusalem. They're taking different routes, of course. Their paths will cross a little bit later on. But we pick it up here in Acts chapter 8 and verse 32, sorry, chapter 9 and verse 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to the visit, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon, the region, region just north, saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothes, clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So, what a great story, right? I want to start here with the end that Peter eventually will end up in Caesarea where he is going to end up meeting with Cornelius. And now we've gone from Jew to half Jew, half Gentile, and Peter's going to meet with a full Gentile. And the way will be open to all. Amen. Amen. But this is awesome news. You know this is this is news. This was so big, so important. I mean, the first miracle is miraculous. Aeneas is healed after eight years. The Bible said this thing spread faster than things spread on social media today. Everybody in the region next to it heard and many people believed. And then Tabitha was raised from the dead. Can you imagine how fast that spread? It spread so quickly. Many, many people believed. You know, I like to think that good news still travels fast. But the bottom line is, as someone once said, a lie will circle the globe faster than the truth can get out of bed. That's the reality. Which is a good lesson when you start hearing something and it's spreading quickly. Might be a good time to check your sources, okay? But Peter, notice, he stays at the house of a tanner. Now, I don't know if you know what tanning is. Tannery? This is how leather was made. And they say that tanneries is one of the most, a tannery is one of the most disgusting places you can ever be. (laughs) There you go. They don't smell good, see? And Ed actually works for a chemical company that actually 
provides chemicals so some of that smell is not as bad. It gets all of the raw flesh and everything off the animal. Yeah, doesn't that sound exciting? You want a job at a tannery, don't you? And Ed so provides the chemicals so you can end up with different color leather and all of that stuff. And, you know, it's not as disgusting. But Ed's company wasn't around at the time of Simon and Tanner. Simon and Tanner lived in a disgusting place. These places were often by the ocean so that the breeze could take it away, the smell. They were awful smelling places. They smelled terrible. And Peter is going into this disgusting place. I visited Jerusalem. I saw the house. Supposed to be Simon Tanner. I don't know if it is or not. It's just what they told me. How would I know any different? It's 2,000 years later. So maybe it is. Bill's an archaeologist. He probably would say it's actually true. But it's pretty amazing, right, that Peter goes into this disgusting home. And listen, Simon and Tanner didn't have, like, this is my house in a tannery. I own a shop down the block. It was all one place. <laughs> in a tannery, you, 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 you brought in the animals and the raw flesh, and, and, and you, you, you scrape the meat. For, and guess what they use for chemicals? Urine and feces. Bring that disgust on out. Bring it out. <laughs> because they've got to get, and this is where Peter's been. This is, this is, I call this Peter's journey of disgust. He's going in to mess with the Samaritans. I can't believe God's got me doing this. But that's not enough. He's going to stay at the home of si Simon the Tanner. And then he's going to go and things are really going to get nasty. Well, let's back up here. Peter, Peter first, he ends up in Lydda. Well, there's a man who's been paralyzed for eight years. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but have you ever been around someone who's been in bed for a long period of time? Let's just say they probably don't smell very good. I mean, I, 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 per perhaps Aeneas had access to daily showers. But can you imagine the chore of trying to clean someone who's paralyzed? I don't think he had daily showers. Can you imagine the smell of the bed sores and all of these things? And here, Peter, he goes into the house and, and he heals the leper or the, the paralyzed man. Isn't that disgusting? So my first point is, you know, we're all kind of on a journey of disgust. And the reality is a challenge for us as Christians to lean into this idea that we are actually going to be called to do some things that might be rather disgusting. I know we think Christianity should be a little bit more clean, but we're all going to have to lean into something that will infringe upon what we consider to be disgusting. Are you with me? See, I think this is, this, is, this is the call of Christianity. It's not comfortable. It's not pretty. And I know it's easy, but we want to focus on the miracle. The miracle happened, and it did. And I believe that miracle led to so many people following God. But Peter had to overcome his own disgust. He has to go in, be in the home of a paralyzed man, and it probably didn't smell good. But he did it. And he healed this man. And he says to him, get on your feet, man. Come on, take up your mat and take this walk with me. You know, it reminds me as well that isn't this the human condition, though? Because weren't we all just a little bit disgusting. If you look back on your own life, I, I, I know your parents, you know, they told you you're beautiful, you're awesome, you're amazing, you're not disgusting, you're so perfect. The reality is, okay, is that we all could have been viewed, probably were viewed, as a little bit disgusting. See, this is the human condition, right? As humans, aren't we all, we're paralyzed. We can't even take one step toward God. We're so paralyzed, we're so messed up, we're so jacked up, and, 
And yet God, he sends someone to us who is willing to overcome their disgust. Maybe they're disgusted of you. Maybe they're disgusted of outreach. Maybe they're disgusted of going to that particular place. Maybe they're disgusted of organized religion altogether. But they overcome their disgust. And just like Peter, they come to you. Not because they necessarily wanted to. They'd rather be doing something else. But they come. Because they're on this journey. They understand. And they come to you. And they're like Peter. They give you instruction that you don't like either. You know, I, don't even, I don't even like the way you said that, Peter. Don't, why couldn't you say it that way? Tell me to get up. Rise up. They give you instructions. They say, hey, man, get up. Rise up, brother. Take up your mat and join me on this walk with you. Isn't that what God did for all of us? Isn't that what God wants to do today for others? Is that not part of the human condition? But the next story is about Tabitha. <laughs> this is an awesome story. Because this is the first time disciple is used in a feminine sense to refer to an actual female. And so we've got Tabitha or Dorcas. She is dead. Now, I don't know if Tabitha is a widow or not. Uh, there's a lot of widows who, who are in her company. Don't really know. Doesn't say she has a husband. It'd be easy to assume. So I don't know. I'll find out later, okay? But Tabitha, the Bible says, had been doing all kind of good. And she got sick and she died. Now, here's what's really interesting as Peter, he's already in Lida and he's sort of traveling along here and he's probably going, I don't know, the spirits leading me along. And, and Lida's about. 30 miles from Jerusalem. So he had traveled some five to nine hours from Jerusalem to Lida. Okay. And then it says that Lida to Joppa, which is another 14 miles or so, which is about another two and a two to four hour walk. It says that she died. They washed her. They put her in the upper room. And then there's two men. Someone said, okay, go get Peter. So these guys journey two to four hours to find Peter. They get there. They convince Peter to go. Then they have to journey another two to four hours back. There's a dead body upstairs, by the way. Probably in rigor. And probably beginning to smell. Trigger takes, well, not an expert, but I Googled it. You can Google anything, you know that? Brendan will confirm. One to six hours, roughly? No, Brendan's not shaking his head. Maybe I Googled the wrong thing. I should have asked Brendan. <laughs> he has no idea. <laughs> One to six hours. Maybe a police officer knows. I don't know. But there's a body upstairs in a little bitty room, and Peter goes into this room. Now, Peter knows. What are you doing going around dead bodies? <laughs> he goes into this room. This is crazy. He goes in a room, there's a dead body, and all the widows are all around crying. Look at what she made. She's so amazing. She's awesome. The Bible says she was a disciple. Can I get an amen? amen. She is a disciple. That's what disciples do. They take care of others. Tabitha Dorcas, she's awesome. She is serving. She's giving. She loves people. Everyone knows this gal, and the widows are greatly impacted. She is important in her community. She is valuable in her community, and people want her back. And then Peter goes up to that room and people are weeping and crying. And I imagine Peter going, Lord, what have you gotten me into now? I'm going to need you to really move here, God. And the Bible says Peter got down on his knees and he prayed. He prayed over this dead body. What an intense scene, right? He's praying, he's praying, and he looks up and says, get up. Again, rise up, girl. Rise up, girl. And she does, she rises up, she sees Peter, and she gets up to her feet. And I love it that the Bible specifically gives us the detail. It says Peter wanted to, he really wanted people to be impacted. He called in the believers. He called in especially 
the widows, those that are on the margin, those that, that are the, the, the least cared about. He calls them the widows, and he says to them, look, here she is. And I can imagine a rejoicing and a celebration. And the news spread. It spread. What, what an incredible God we serve. It's not about Peter. What a God we serve that does incredible miracles. But is that not the condition also of humans? Are we just dead? People are dead in their sins. People are just, they're dying. They're wasting away. They're smelly. They don't know they smell it. They put on really fancy perfume and things like that make them smell good. But they smell so bad. They're flat out disgusting, some of them. Aren't they disgusting? Those sinners are so disgusting. Look at them, dead, rotting flesh. Now go touch them. That's right. Get over there and get next to them. Get over there and pray with them, pray for them. Yes, it is disgusting. But God, no, maybe he doesn't see it that way. Maybe there's a miracle that needs to happen for the very person that you find the most repulsive. Maybe there's a miracle. See, because, well, don't forget about your miracle, amen? Don't, don't forget about where you were. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. That little light, but I'm not going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to hide it under a bush. No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Are you looking for a miracle? Or are you expecting the impossible? I want to challenge us to not give up on miracles. You know, the greatest asset on earth is people. There ain't nothing you're taking with you to heaven except a friend. I want to challenge you to not give up on miracles. We all are miracles. I mean, look around the room. You're people, we're all miracles. You're all miracles. Teens, you don't realize how jacked up your parents were. <laughs> they were so messed up. I know your life is awesome. And you're probably thinking, yeah, you know, I'll kind of come to God on my, I'll just kind of, maybe, you know, I, maybe I'll start. Look, your parents came in here like, oh, my God. I need Jesus so much. They came in here begging, on their knees, pleading. Because they knew how jacked up they were. A little secret. They're still a little messed up, you know what I mean? I can tell you that because you know they're messed up, amen? But don't you take for granted the price they paid. But are you still looking for miracles? I know Satan, he is after us. Here's what Satan likes. See, we don't see miracles. We don't look for miracles anymore because Satan wants us to be discouraged. The enemy wants us to be discouraged, wants us to feel beaten down, wants us to feel weary. I'm so tired of praying for my kids to get saved. I'm so tired of praying for things to change in this country and my neighborhood. I'm so tired of praying about my own changes. I'm so tired of praying for my spouse. I'm just weary. The enemy wants us to be negative, wants us to be faithless, wants us to be fearful, wants us to be anxious, wants us to be excuse makers. Be, wallow in self-pity, feel hopeless. But the Spirit of God wants us to believe in miracles, wants us to be encouraged, wants us to feel built up, wants us to rise up, 
wants us to be not weary but energized, not negative but positive, not faithless but faithful, not anxious but peaceful, not fearful but courageous, not excuse making but taking responsibility, not wild in self pity but outward focus, not hopeless but hopeful. Amen. See, the Spirit of God is powerful because we serve a powerful God that is still in a miracle working business today, brothers and sisters. Isaiah 40, verse 30 says this even youths grow weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. That, that is, that's how we keep looking for a miracle. But what if my miracle hasn't come, Vince? Then I'll leave you with these seven things you can do. Remember that God loves humanity and God loves each of you. Remember God's faithfulness. You can read it in the word. You can talk to a brother or sister in the church. God has been faithful. Remember his faithfulness. Thirdly, pray what you see in Scripture. Go to the Bible and pray, God, I see you did this. You did this for Aeneas. You did this for Tabitha. You did this for the people around. God, do something miraculous today. God, I know you can do it. Pray what you see in Scripture. Fourth, be okay with not knowing. Sometimes it's helpful. I, don't, I just don't know when God's going to do it. I just don't know. I just wish I knew. Let's just be okay with not knowing. When's God going to do that? I don't know. But I will be faithful. That is the definition of faith, amen? amen. Five, invite other people to pray with you. Pray for them. Just say, you know, would you pray with me? And you know what? Don't get mad at them if they forget. Just remind them. Are you still praying for me? Can you, can you pray with me? Invite others to pray. Six, be surrendered. Be at peace. And seven, worship God. You know, whether God does that miracle or not exactly where you have it envisioned in your mind, just worship God anyway. God is doing miracles. He has not only has done miracles, he's doing miracles. Worship God. Worship God. Hey, we got a vaccine. Does that point you to Jesus? Do you say, well, thank you, God? Do you say, thank you, God? Well, I'm not taking it. Okay, that's fine. But do you thank God? Do you thank God? No, what does it point you to? Well, the government didn't roll it out fast enough, and it hurt. And my, okay, great, you know, great. That's a little bit miraculous. It's a little bit miraculous what's happening. And that's just one miracle. Dare I say, a small one, okay? God is in the miracle working business. I'll close with this. Is your, is your disgust keeping you from seeing? the miracles of God. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Vince. Um, just, it's just really incredible to think uh, just how from where we came and the disgusting nature that, that uh, we have to deal with in terms of ourselves and our own sinful nature and um, that God calls us to reach out to others where, who are like us, 
And uh, yet, we're, we're, it's easy to think of ourselves as not being as disgusting as the other person. But it really isn't true. And um, thank you, Vince. Just, just incredible. When Peter obeyed God and went to these disgusting places and do these disgusting things, he was, it made an impact that we read about today. So awesome. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Paul Kircher, and um, my wife and I, Kibra, have uh, five boys. And uh, I'm here to lead, not five boys, a five fa member family. <laughs> not five boys. Three boys. I'm starting to, <laughs> I'm starting to launch into more kids. Amazing miracles happen all the time. <laughs> but uh, we love our three boys, and um, I'm sure glad it's not five. But um, I'm I'm here to lead our thoughts on communion, and uh, you know I. I I teach at an uh, uh, online university, and it's uh, fairly easy to talk to people in terms of things that I know, and I can present to them things that, uh, that they don't know, so it makes it easy. But when y you get up and you, you talk about things and, uh, you know, about how th what the cross means to you and, um, and just, you know, even the things that Vince was talking about and just where we're at as, as individuals, that's where you start to get really intimidated really kind of, you feel insignificant, you feel small. You're not teaching people on some, some fact that you know that uh, you took a lot of long time in college to learn. But to really think what, what Jesus did when he, when he went to the cross and how he came down to, to our world and, and lived among us disgusting people and, um, and, and died for us, which is just amazing to me. All right, in Matthew 26... Starting in verse 26, um, you don't have to turn there, but feel free if you want to. Uh, Jesus was, it was at the Last Supper, and Jesus uh, came there. He brought his disciples together, and it says in verse 26, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many as the f for the forgiveness of sins. This is, this is just before Jesus, his body was literally broken and his blood was literally spilled. And um, as we partake in the communion that, that represents the body and blood of Christ that was spilled for us, we don't just accept the sacrifice that he made for us. We participate in it. The Apostle Paul went even further in uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 where he said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of the resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. This is difficult. This is difficult for me because when you think about what Paul's actually saying here, he's, he loved Jesus and wanted to be like Jesus so much that he wasn't saying, I want to die in Christ. He's, he's not even saying, you know, I know I'm going to have to go through some sufferings. He's saying, I want to be like Jesus so much, I want to suffer like he suffered. That, that, that is intense because, I know mean, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, the suffering of Jesus was very, very intense. And for me, it's like, okay, well, the way that I think, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go through what he did if I have to, but hopefully it doesn't come to that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or... I would like to participate in a very small fraction <laughs> of what Jesus suffered just so I can get a taste of what he did without actually going the full nine yards. But that's not what Paul said. He's like, I want to – it's not, it's not I, I hope I don't have to or, or I will – but I want to. It was a desire of his to share in the suffering of Christ. 
which is incredible. I don't like to think about my that for myself, and I also also don't like to think about that for my for my wife or my kids, right? I mean, there are times as a parent where even uh, we we have a um, uh, senior in high school that's getting ready to go to college, and there's a lot of things that has to be done in terms of, of the to, to prepare, to apply, to do all the things he needs to do to, to get the, the school that would be good, the, 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 if there's scholarships he can get, whatever. And there's times when you want to say, okay, this is on you. And I, I admire parents that, that do that, that say, okay, look, this is your responsibility. You're going to sink or swim. You made your bed. You lie in it. Um, and I, I admire that. I'm, that's not my nature. Too many times I've, I and my wife have kind of rushed in and saved our son when he forgot about something or he wasn't focused on something because we think, gosh, this could affect him 20, 30, 40 years down the road, if he, his choice right here. And, um, and it's hard, and sometimes that's happened, and I've thought to myself, um, I wonder if it was really best for us to step in there if he really just needs to learn that. Right, if he needed to just take the hit and, and learn it, and um, so I wrestle with that. And like I said, I admire parents that uh, that that sometimes you know, I need to be more like that. Say, look, this is this is you. You've got to learn this responsibility. But one thing's for sure is I'm I'm sure glad that um, that God didn't look at Jesus dying on the cross and saying, you know what, this is too much. I'm just going to jump in here, and and people aren't aren't worth it. Um, I'm glad he did. He didn't say that, and he didn't do that. And um, you know, for me, I'd rather just kind of skip the suffering part and go on to resurrection. Right? That's awesome. In fact, uh, actually, if, if uh, you have extended family that's in the Eastern Orthodox faith, today is Easter, and there's like uh, three, four hundred million people in the world that uh, that are, are Eastern Orthodox. And my extended family, my wife's family, is Eastern Eastern Orthodox, so they're celebrating Easter today. So happy Easter! But um, that's where I'd like to go. Let's just go straight to the resurrection. But let's face it. None of us would want to see a movie where the, the, you know, true story, uh, where the person was born into luxury, they faced zero challenges, they did nothing and worked hard at nothing to make something great, they just enjoyed life, and two hours later it's the end of the movie. (laughs) None of us would want to see that. There's a reason. Right? Um, it's like this for Jesus. The struggle and the suffering also help to define us and to show our love to God and to others. This is how Jesus was, and he, this is how he designed us. We, we want to, to struggle. Internally, there's this thing of, I want to do something great, and it's going to take struggling, whatever it takes. Teddy Roosevelt once said, nothing in the world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, difficulty. I have never in my life envied a human being who led an easy life. I have envied a great many people who led difficult lives and led them well. We have the opportunity to commit ourselves to participating in the, in, in the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, the suffering, and um, I pray that we can really take this opportunity as we take take the bread and the wine and to, to really embrace that and not back away from it because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for just loving us so much that, uh, that you had to turn away from Jesus as he bore our sins on the cross and for not stepping in so that we could have a chance, so that we could be saved. And uh, I thank you for, um, for just showing, our lo- showing your love to us. Just help us, help us love you. Help us, help us not return the favor in the sense that we could do anything to, to earn it, but help us just get the, get the mind of Christ and think about things and live out our, our, our destiny and the purpose that you have for us so that we too can, can love others and show your love to others. Thank you for loving us. Bless this communion and uh, Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. What a, what a fantastic service we had today. Uh, what an un unusual topic to be on our minds right now. A journey of disgust. And, uh, you know, I really, I really was very stirred both by the communion and by the, uh, the offering. Uh, but uh, as we kind of think, okay, so what do we do with everything that we heard? You know, what, what is the call on your heart right now? And I think the thing that was kind of true of all three parts of our service today is that there is something inside of us that is, that is being summoned to engage with our faith with everything we have. You know, whether it's from the example of Paul or the things that Jeff shared or, or, the, or what Vince was kind of walking us through, uh, it, it, was, it was so evident to me that he was talking about all these jobs that were disgusting. Well, Peter had a disgusting job. He was a fisherman. Who would be this guy? to complain about smell. And I think the correlation is the same. We've been delivered from things. We have been pardoned from things. We have been spared things that you know if you weren't mindful of Christ, you would be so caught up in. And I just think the call... The call is to say, who are we not to go get involved? To not go out and reach out. To not seek to find so. Let me get involved and be a part of the miracle. And I think that is something worth praying about. And if you're really daring something to ask God to give you the opportunity to do something about. And then for all of us to just go act it out. What a, what a great stirring Sunday we've had. And we are going to have an amazing time next week. As uh, we will be right out here. I just I, I know we had the announcements. Kathy, great job as always with the announcements. But some announcements need to be repeated because even the Lord had to say Simon, Simon a couple of times. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to be right out here. It's going to be outdoors. We need to be praying for great weather, just like we did for our Easter. Amen, bro. Uh, uh, we need to really make this a time where we not only bring our mamas, but anyone who has been born of a mother. Uh, we need to bring all those people. Uh, and have a great time as our teens are going to lead the service. It is going to be an amazing day. So let's get fired up for that. And as we close out, I just want to read a couple of passages uh, to you, just to remind you how God sees you. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore amen you are dismissed